Hello, I'm Jamie Rice, a Director of Collections and Research at Maine Historical Society. Uh, today I'm speaking with Dr. Kate McMahon, a museum specialist at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture's Center for Study of Global Slavery, as part of a larger series of conversations pertaining to the Maine's bicentennial and how different people and different communities experienced or were impacted by the separation of Maine from Massachusetts and the broader implications of Maine entering the Union in 1820. Today's focus is on Maine's complex relationship with the slave economy and the global slave trade. As many of you know, Maine became the 23rd state in 1820 as part of the Missouri Crisis, which is more widely known as the Missouri Compromise, where Maine entered the Union as a free state with Missouri entering as a slave state to preserve the balance of slaveholding versus free states within the Union. While a majority of people in Maine were in favor of separating from Massachusetts, a significant portion of that population did not want to become a state if their statehood was tied to perpetuating slavery in the United States. Maine's strong abolitionist or anti-slavery sentiment, which is shared with its Massachusetts brethren, both having outlawed the slave ownership in 1783, presented real challenges for the Maine public as they balanced independence from Massachusetts with perpetuating slavery. Ultimately, the Missouri Compromise prevailed, and while abolitionist and anti-slavery activities grew in number throughout Maine in the decades leading to the Civil War, a portion of Maine's economy continued to rely on Southern and Caribbean slave labor, with some instances the slave trade itself. Today's conversation briefly explores the complex relationship between Maine and the slave economy and presented within the context of before and after 1820. So uh, welcome, Kate. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk about Maine in the context of slavery and what Maine's um, difficult relationship is with that, um, with the broader understanding of the Missouri Compromise. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, Maine has a very complex relationship with slavery um, and the, the broader slave trade and the global slave economies. 1820 and the, the years leading up to 1820 in the 18-teens were um, incredibly divisive years, not all that unlike what is happening right now. And the big question then was whether slavery was going to be expanded into the Western territories as they became states. Um, you're right, New England, most of Northern New England by 1800 had abolished slavery in their states. So Maine was already technically a free place in 1820 when it became a state. However, Mainers were deeply engaged in the broader economies of slavery. And I think one of the things that has happened over the course of the development of our understanding our historical memory, our collective memory of what New England is, has eliminated slavery from history. Uh, so we talk about our mills and the, and the importance of all of the mills in Northern New England to the economy, to the Industrial Revolution, to our states, our towns. I mean, they physically built the places in, in Maine, Biddeford, Saco. I mean, these are mill towns. Uh, and yet we don't think about where did the raw material that was being produced in these mills come from. And that material was almost exclusively until 1865 being produced by enslaved labor. And it even continued after in 1865 because Portland especially was very important in the global sugar trade and sugar was produced exclusively by enslaved people in the Caribbean and in South and Latin America. So New England continued to profit off of the, lab the enslaved labor uh, of uh, people of African descent and later actually transitioning into the coolie trade, which is the trade in the indentured Chinese people into the later 19th century. So slavery, the global slave trade and forced labor or um, unequal treatment of, of laborers, Mainers were deeply invested in that economy through the merchant economies. And so 1820 is really a pivotal year. This is the year in 1808, the United States abolished participation in the foreign slave trade in an act called the Act Prohibiting 
uh, the importation of slaves uh, into the United States. And essentially that was passed in 1807 after Great Britain uh, put a lot of pressure on the United States government to abolish our participation in the slave trade. In subsequent years between 1808 and 1820, two other acts were passed because Americans did not stop participating in the slave trade. And in fact, our participation in the slave trade continued to increase. So by 1820, Americans, and especially people in Northern New England, were very engaged in the slave economies and in the slave trade. So in 1820, the United States government passed its most stringent penalty on participation in the slave trade yet. And that was called the Act of 1820. It was passed May 15th, 1820. So just two months after Maine was admitted to the Union. And in fact, these debates were happening on the same day in Congress over whether or not we were going to uh, put, make participation in slave trade piracy for Americans and thus a capital offense. Um, and uh, at the same time, we are debating whether slavery is being expanded. And there's all of these debates among congressmen uh, and other people just broadly about reopening the African slave trade in order to bring people, bring enslaved laborers into the Western territories. So these, our statehood is extremely tied to the history of slavery. And in fact, without slavery, Maine probably would not have, without this debate, Maine would not have become a state in 1820. It's, it's, I think it's really um, pivotal to understand that slavery isn't just about owning human beings. And I think a lot of people do see that as that uh, Maine, had outlawed, uh, outlawed the, the ownership of human beings, but actively participated in the slave trade. And I think a lot of people don't realize the close relationship that Maine had with Cuba and, um, and the relationship with that in the Maine economy, especially within Portland, with a, a bustling economy related to the import uh, of sugar and the exportation of molasses. So can you talk a little bit more about Maine's role in the slave economy after the, um, it was no longer uh, legal to own slaves, but before uh, slavery was um, outlawed, in the United, outlawed in the United States as a whole? Sure. So I mean, in Northern New England, we of course love to talk about our rich maritime history, both uh, from the, the captains and the sailors, but also as the places these vessels were built. And Maine and Massachusetts of were the two highest states, had the most sailors, more than New York, even though our population was a, a tenth of what it, of New York's at that time, um, we had the the market on the merchant economy in the Eastern United States. And so Mainers, at the same time, in the eight, early, early 19th century, there's a few different things that are happening in Maine that are pushing Mainers to engage in the slave trade. Number one is the shipbuilding industry uh, is extremely tied, shipbuilding and the development of shipbuilding and, and different types of ships, faster ships, more agile ships is, is deeply tied to the slave trade because they were building many of these vessels over the course of the 18th and 19th century were being adapted and molded in order to navigate the difficult weather, the difficult currents of the African coast specifically. Um, and so our, our shipbuilding industry was being pushed by this pressure of the slave trade to build faster ships, bigger ships, better ships, and, sh and main vessels, because they are the most technologically advanced, there is the, they are the fastest, they are the best built, they have the best timber, the best pine that's being brought in from Maine and New Hampshire and up into Canada. These things are, are leading main vessels to enter this slave trade and being preferred by Brazilian and Cuban slave traders specifically. They are looking for American ships. And part of this is because after the War of 1812, the United States and Great Britain came to an agreement that um, American vessels could not be searched without just cause by the British. Um, and not every country had that kind of treaty with Great Britain. And, and so it, slave traders looked for these American ships. 
Um, and because Maine and Massachusetts had the most ships in the global economy, that's where vessels started to go. Um, and beginning in the 18, in the 1820s, that during that time period, there was a lot of illegal traffic to some of the French colonial islands in the Caribbean, places like Martinique. Over time, um, as uh, there is increasing political pressure on certain countries as places, especially in the Caribbean, go through their own emancipation struggles and go through their own forms of rebellion, revolution, um, as it travels around the Caribbean, these ships begin to, to shift. And so they go down to Brazil. And Brazil is the capital of, of really of global slavery. More than 6 million enslaved people were brought to Brazil alone. Whereas in the United States, only around 300,000 enslaved people were actually brought from Africa that we know of. So you look at the relative difference and that is all due to sugar production. Sugar was a killer. The average life expectancy for an enslaved person on a sugar plantation was just seven years. And so in these sugar producing places, they constantly needed additional labor because every year the desire for sugar goes up exponentially throughout the 19th century. And it grows and grows and grows until it's billions of tons being transported by the, um, by the mid century. So Mainers are, even back in 1820, there are main ships engaged in the slave trade and it continues and increases. Uh, and by the 1830s, Mainers are heavily, heavily involved in the slave trade to Brazil especially. It's, a, it's amazing to think that how complex of a, how a, the spider web of the economic relationship to the slave economy and to really understand how people skirted the law, found loopholes, took advantage of uh, resources that they had available to them to find ways to, to make this happen regardless of the legislation that was being passed. And to be fair, a lot wasn't being done about slavery at the federal level, but what was being done was skirted by being able to take advantage of the treaties with the British and to be something that was uh, meant to protect merchants and to keep sailors from being pressed into service and all the sort of things we, we think we know about the War of 1812 and the complexities that come out that. I know we have collections here at Maine Historical Society with actual correspondence in the way that people sort of navigated around the laws and would pick up human beings in Africa, take them to the Caribbean, drop them off in a place where it was, a, was legal, pick up a good that they could then trade in another place where it wasn't legal and to find ways to kind of manipulate that system. And to, to think that people in Maine were still doing this while we um, think of ourselves as a free state and as coming into the union in a sort of a, in an effort to, um, to remove the institution of slavery or, or to, to, to find that balance is, is really complex. So your work at the Smithsonian obviously focuses a lot on the global slave trade. And do you find that uh, that this, you were saying Maine and Massachusetts had a, a high ratio of that. Do you find that, um, that there are other places in the United States that have an equally complex, or do you find that this is sort of a unique microcosm because of the nature of where we are in Northern New England? Um, I think, each location has a different, you know, each sort of region in the United States has a different relationship with the global slave trade. And um, Northern New England during the illegal period was really the central uh, hub of American participation in the slave trade. Most of them left out of New York, but there were Cuban and Portuguese and Brazilian merchants in New York City looking for New England ships to hire. Uh, and, um, but they, each region, Charleston had, had some major slave trading. And, you know, if you go back during the legal period, other parts of the United States had major um, involvement in the slave trade. And there were also ports in the United States, while they may not have, like Baltimore, where I live, which was not so much a disembarkation point for the illegal slave trade, but a huge disembarkation point for the domestic American slave trade, which moved along, which main vessels were deeply, deeply involved in. Uh, we talk about the cotton packets a lot in Maine, um, these vessels that transported cotton between New Orleans, Mobile, and Ports North. 
these vessels, while they were transporting cotton, were also moving enslaved people. So some of our most famous seafaring families, sea shipbuilding families, like the Sole family of, of Freeport, I have found records that not only were some of their vessels engaged in the illegal slave trade, foreign illegal slave trade, they were also regularly transporting enslaved people along with their cotton and their sugar and their other products that they were moving. And so I think what we need to, we need to shift our understanding of maritime history, that it's not the history of the slave trade and maritime history, but that it is one shared history, that slavery is a deep, deep part of maritime history, global history, and the history of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and Mainers, there is this deep complexity of what we understand of as freedom in Maine, because while Maine technically outlawed slavery uh, in 1783, there were a number of indentured servants uh, of African descent that were brought to Maine, including some people who were transported aboard slave ships that were brought as indentured servants, but their lived reality, their movement was forced, they did not choose to leave Africa, they did not choose to leave their families. They were, they were brought to the United States, put in an indenturement of seven years or more, and, and essentially forced to work in some main farms. So how is that, how is that free? What, what does that mean for us if we see much later, uh, we're gonna turn to one particular story in a minute, of 20, 30, 40 years later of African descended people being forced into labor in very unequal circumstances. And what does that mean for people that are living right now? I mean, we have a historical moment when we are all examining how systemic racism has been built. And I think this history, the fact that this history has been completely whitewashed out of New England, a place like New England, we need to question we, I have gotten the question multiple times, why is Maine so white? Uh, and, and this is something there's been, people have always wondered, what is this reason? And I think we have to look to these moments that these people that were doing this were the people in power. And so they built these structures of inequality that while they're not formal, like segregation in the South, they ha are just as pervasive and just as damaging to, to people. So you have some specific stories that you'd like to be able to share with us. And I'd also like to point out to those of you uh, who are listening to, to this that, Kate, you are from Maine. Yeah. And so I, you know, I want to emphasize that when you say our state, I mean, this is really, this is not only obviously um, your, your work and, and what you focused on academically and through your education and through the work that you do, but you are also from Maine. And, and as you know, in Maine, that makes a difference. I, I'm from Maine. I went to the University of Southern Maine for my bachelor's and my master's degree. And I am routinely in Maine doing talks and things like that. And uh, I still consider myself to be mostly a Maine resident. I'm there every couple months. So, um, you know, this is a deeply important history to me. And, you know, my childhood, my upbringing in a very white town of Shapley in Maine, um, that we never learned about slavery. We never learned about Maine and slavery. Uh, you know, how can we help young people especially begin to question these narratives and to really do the work of uncovering how the state, how the region and how the country have been shaped by slavery, racism and white supremacy. And so I think these stories are lenses into the past that can help us dismantle um, some of the, um, unfortunately, some of our heroes need to be brought down to, to reality that is, that shows the full scope of their experience as people. And not everyone does everything good all the time. And I think we need to, to really understand and examine who these people actually were. Well said. One such of these stories that um, persists farther into the 19th century is that of um, two vessels and one man who was central to both of these ships. Uh, Captain Ebenezer Farwell was from Vassalboro. He is part of the Farwell family, which is, or was part of the Farwell family, which was 
a significant founding family in the town of Vassalboro. And in fact, his father's house, uh, which you see in the top right image here, is on the National Register of Historic Places. And it is, uh, it's a it's late 18th century building quite modest, um, but was the site of his family's farm. And it's directly across the street from um, some of the, the uh, open access of the, the river that eventually leads to the Atlantic. So it was a, a prime location in the town of Vassalboro. His son Ebenezer uh, became a ship captain and was a captain that was routinely going to the coast of Africa in the, uh, as well as the Caribbean in the 1830s. Uh, and in 1838, he was the captain of a vessel called the Transit, which was built in Bath in 1829 um, by Johnson Williams and Company, uh, which was a, a shipbuilder that was near the railroad in, in Bath. And this vessel made a number of trips to Africa and um, was uh, brought under sus suspicious circumstances. However, I have not found direct evidence that these other trips were slave trips. Uh, however, in 1838, they went to Liberia. And when they got there, it's unknown where they went before they returned to the United States. I think they probably went to the Caribbean. I'm not exactly sure. However, it's, he purchased a, a load of enslaved people and brought them back uh, to the Caribbean and eventually returned up to Northern New England uh, and dropped one enslaved person, a man named Yazee, with his father at this house in Vassalboro to work as an indentured servant. Um, and the, the records around this incident indicate that he was desperate to get back to Africa that he was, when they were on the vessel, he tried to jump overboard, he tried to escape from them, he did not want to be there. Um, also with him were three other enslaved people that when he returned to ho the home port of the transit in New York, he dropped them off with the intention of selling them. Um, and he was a eventually arrested by the port authorities in New York City after they discovered these three enslaved people who were able to go into a free black community in New York uh, and became part of a, um, who, who petitioned essentially on their behalf and said, these men were brought here as slaves. Uh, and Farwell was arrested and charged. Um, he claimed that he, these men were indentured servants, that when they got on the vessel, that they had been given indenturement papers. However, if you look at the evidence, it's quite clear that uh, these men were given their indenturement when they were in the middle of the ocean. So they did not agree to get on that ship. They got on that ship, they were given an indenturement, which is probably forged, and, uh, and were essentially um, to be sold as slaves in the United States. And so Yazi is taken back to to Vassalboro and works for some period of time on the family farm. I'm not exactly sure when um, Yazid returned to Africa. However, he does not appear to be in the town after 1840. Um, that may or may, may could, it could be because he's just not on the census record and I don't have any other way to really tell. Um, however, it does appear that he, he's not a long-term resident of Vassalboro. I haven't seen any evidence of him anywhere else. So unless he's changed his name. So in 1839, after he has been acquitted of these charges, set free, essentially the court says they don't have enough evidence to uh, convict him of this because it's a capital offense. Um, so he gets off and goes back to Vassalboro, takes all of this money that he made because just like with the illicit drug trade, when you make something illegal, it drives the profit margins up. It increases the risk, but the profit margins increase, and they increased exponentially as we crept closer to the American Civil War. So Farwell turns around and takes the money he made off of the transit and builds this Greek revival house in Vassalboro. And if anyone has driven through Vassalboro, it is pretty unmistakable. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, it is directly next door to the Riverview House, which was his father's house. 
So Farwell built this glorious Greek revival mansion and ran out of money in 1841. And so he decides that he's gonna do another venture to Africa. And he purchases the, the vessel Mary Carver, a schooner, which was built in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And it was out of Plymouth, so it left from Cape Cod this time. They get to Liberia. And here are two differing accounts, essentially, of, of what happened next. Um, the, the account by the official United States Navy report, which uh, came out of the Sloop of War USS Saratoga records, which we'll turn to in a minute, essentially said that Farwell uh, and his crew took the Mary Carver to a town in called Little Barabee, which is near Cape Palmas, which was a major site for the slave trade in Liberia, um, and also a major site for the American Colonization Society and the, the colonization movement in Liberia. So Farwell travels down the coast to these small towns in, in Liberia and pulls into this village um, and is, the official US Navy account says there were, they were attacked unprovoked by these villagers. The account that the king later gave in his testimony said that Farwell and his crew killed two of the, two of the locals and then the locals killed and sunk, uh, killed the crew and sunk the vessel. Um, it's extremely, reading between the lines of that, they were there attempting to purchase enslaved people and they did not like the price that they were being charged um, by the local people in Liberia. So Farwell is murdered. It, it makes it back into all of these different uh, newspapers uh, becomes, of course, this big incident in Maine, and Farwell's widow never lives in the house, and she actually sells the house to uh, the Weeks family, and Samuel Weeks is purported to have run uh, the Underground Railroad through this house, so it, it's a very interesting history of this building that it was built with proceeds from selling enslaved people, and then this family then uses it for the Underground Railroad, and it's supposed to be haunted. There's all this mythology built up around this building. Um, but essentially, uh, a year later, the United States Navy has, in 1842, passed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. Uh, or rather, the United States government has passed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty with uh, Great Britain that says, it establishes three things. Number one, it establishes the border between Maine and Canada uh, because of the the war that essentially the nonviolent conflict between American and Canadian timbermen that was taking place on the St. John's River. The second thing it does is it, um, it, it gives the freedom to a group of enslaved people that um, had taken the, the ship Creole, uh, which was a slave ship that was moving from Richmond, Virginia down to New Orleans and sailed it to the Bahamas, much like the Amistad. Uh, and they were actually, as part of this, the, the United States government agreed that they were free citizens and they could stay in the Bahamas, and, and they did. And the third thing it is establishes is the building and the construction, money to build United States Navy ships to cruise Africa, the Caribbean, and Brazil looking for Americans participating in the slave trade because British ships can't board them. So Americans have been getting off scot-free and it's been very difficult for them to police the traffic. So the first vessel that is built is the USS Saratoga. And that vessel is built in Kittery at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And you can see here this fascinating image on the right of the sailors aboard the vessel. Um, so they take the USS Saratoga to Liberia and their intention is to enact revenge and punish these villagers. Um, when they get to the village, Little Baraby, the they find that the the um, people who had killed Farwell have since died, and yet they kill the king, um, and Commodore Perry and the, the crew of the Saratoga proceed to sail down the coast of Liberia on, on the border with Côte d'Ivoire, and burned seven villages and killed probably hundreds of people. And this document is in the, uh, the Maine Historical Society. This is part of the Spalding Collection. Um, it is a, a 
Spalding was a doctor and um, he, he had given this actually as a paper, I think at the Maine Historical Society back in the late 1800s. Um, so he studied this case and, um, and this is part of a section of a journal from a sailor that was on board this vessel, one of those men in that picture of what they did. And I think it is an extremely stunning document because it, it gives us, not only does it give a glimpse into, there's a lot of descriptions about the villages, the towns and the people and the structures of the way that these people lived, but it also gives us a glimpse into American colonization. And if you read here, um, they, they go over the, the discussion of what happened with Mary Carver and then a few pages later, they are talk, the sailor is talking about how, um, they wanted to, they, they had a deep desire to kill someone. And so they started essentially going after these people who were fleeing from them. And they were shooting people, women and children out of trees. They were, um, they were attacking these men who, who were African men that were assisting, who ended up being, uh, assisting the USS Saratoga. They were not part of, they were not part of the community. They were completely separate group of people. And so I think this case of the transit of the Carver and ultimately of the Saratoga, three Northern New England ships, two of them from Maine, full of Mainers and people from Massachusetts tells us that we do not fully understand how deeply racism, um, the history of slavery and, and the history of white supremacy is embedded in Maine's history. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is not a Southern issue. Um, this is not a Northern issue. This is an American issue. And that's the thing that I think we really need to understand. So uh, obviously with um, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and with the, um, to, to the end of American slavery, as it were, at the end of the Civil War, in that context of that, where, where does this uh, relationship with the slave economy go? I mean, it simply doesn't disappear. So does, is there, um, what, what happens when it becomes, um, at that point, at the end of the Civil War, when we start to move into the Reconstruction period, what, what does that mean for the slave economy in the context of, of the maritime economy? Of course, that also dovetails with um, the dialing back of the maritime economy. And when you see the introduction of the railroad and you start to see a shift and a change, I mean, Portland in, in itself what, you know, starts to decrease as, a, as an American port starts to get smaller and starts to bring in. So how, how does that kind of work together? Oh, I mean, I think the heyday of New England's, uh, I think these, these, this is not a coincidence that the 18th, the late, the, the, the antebellum period leading up to the Civil War is really the heyday of Maine's shipbuilding economy, merchant economies, and things begin to shift after the Civil War, um, shift to steel ships, much bigger ships, but really Mainers continue to engage in, in the slave economy and other economies tied to um, the forced movement of, of black and brown people. And so I have found vessels well into the 1870s from Maine and, and Massachusetts that were transporting um, people, they begin to shift to the Pacific Ocean, essentially. The Pacific Ocean is the new, um, it's the new, by the 1850s, it's the, it's the new frontier. And so there's all of these new people to exploit, essentially. And so they begin to travel to the Sandwich Islands, which become Hawaii, they're traveling to Fiji, they're traveling to these other places, and they're transporting um, indentured servants uh, to South and Latin America still, because there still needs to be someone to make the sugar. There still needs to be someone to cut the lumber. They do not have, they do not want to pay a fair wage in order to use free labor. And so they, they come up with these unequal contracts. And so Maine becomes very important in the, what's called the coolie trade, which is the trade of indentured, uh, Cuban, I mean, indentured Chinese people to Cuba. Um, as well as other forms of this trade. And so you see Mainers are playing a huge role in the colonization, uh, the exploration of the Pacific world, like places like Hawaii, um, 
even up into Alaska and Russia. So really our definition of what's, what happens shifts, but there's a running theme of um, there, is, there is an unequal relationship here between the, the merchants, the, the seamen, and the people that they're transporting. And the people that they are transporting are not always free. In, in the way that we consider freedom. They may not be technically enslaved, but their experiences, their mortality rates aboard the vessels are the same. They, they experience the same type of life expectancy when they arrive on the sugar plantations. They're experiencing the same diseases and mistreatment. So how do we think about how that has shaped even into what happens in the 20th century? Malaga Island, in 1912, the eviction of the residents of Malaga Island in 1912 did not happen in a vacuum. That did not just suddenly everyone woke up one day and said, we don't want this black community off of Phippsburg anymore. It was decades, hundreds of years of the systemic white supremacism that pushed black Mainers to the margins that allowed these rich white men to become the presidents of our banks, the presidents, uh, I mean, some of these corporations are still in business, these banks are still in business, um, they built the physical environments of Portland and of other towns in Maine, and so I think we need to really understand what the legacy of that history is and how that has shifted and changed over the subsequent decades. So I think understanding the legacy and the legacy of these issues is, is a really large takeaway. Um, uh, before we wrap up, do you have any um, sort of, uh, do you have any major takeaway from this conversation that you would just like, a, the last kind of final point uh, that you would like to make um, with, with understanding Maine's complex relationship with the slave economy? Yeah, I think the takeaway I want people to, to really, have is to do the history. It's not really that hard. Um, pick up, uh, pick up a stone in your town. Go to go to the old cemetery and see who died in Africa. And if you think about why they would die in Africa in 1820, 1830, 1840, um, it, there's not a lot of real legitimate reason that is not either directly or indirectly tied to the slave trade. Um, and so. This history, it's, I mean, honestly, I, I, some of this, of course, this wonderful journal requires archival work, but I got, I got pretty far with Google Books. So really, I think that the point is that you can do this history, you can participate in this history, you can take your class if you're teaching kids through doing some of these primary source work to really begin because the books aren't there. You're not going to find this history in a, in a standard textbook. So how can we then um, encourage the next generation of people to, to not only study the history, but also to ask for it and to push for it and say, we want to be taught this. Um, and I think that really can be a powerful way that we can, as, as white people, as allies, as, uh, we can really help to dismantle this historical narrative that has been so damaging. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for the work that you're doing uh, with the Smithsonian. I had the, priv the privilege of visiting the museum earlier in the spring and it was so busy I couldn't see some of the exhibits. So there's nothing better to see in a museum is too many things. <laughs> So it's wonderful. It's great. Uh, and you'll be joining us later in the summer, summer 2020, for a talk that kind of dives deeper into these topics. So I hope people will join us virtually for that as well. And these topics are so important in uh, considering what's going on in the United States right now. It's a complex legacy and it continues to affect us and impact us in the 21st century, 400 years after the first enslaved people, first African enslaved peoples were brought to what is now the United States. And this is a broader issue. There are, as you mentioned with the Chinese, if you look at the Scotch Irish, there's a lot of legacy of indentured servitude, slavery, and the combination of the two uh, in New England. It's, it's important for us to understand that this is an American issue at the end of the day. So thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you.